Listening Section Directions This test measures your ability to understand conversations and lectures in English. The listening section is divided into two separate timed parts. You will hear each conversation or lecture only one time. After each conversation or lecture, you will answer some questions on it. The questions typically ask about the main idea and supporting details. Some questions ask about a speaker's purpose or attitude. Answer the questions based on what is stated or implied by the speakers. You may take notes while you listen. You may use your notes to help you answer the questions. Notes will not be scored. In some questions, you will see this icon. This means that you will hear, but not see. Part of the question. Some of the questions have special directions. These directions appear in a gray box on the screen. Most questions are worth one point. If question is worth more than one point, it will have special directions that indicate how many points you can receive. You must answer each question. After you answer, click on Next, then click on OK to confirm your answer and go on to the next question. After you click on OK, you cannot return to previous questions. In an actual test or during this practice test, a clock at the top of the screen will show you how much time is remaining. The clock will not count down while you are listening. The clock will count down only while you are answering questions. Click on Continue at any time to dismiss these directions. Listen to a conversation between a student and a professor in an academic setting. Hi, Emily. How are you doing today? Oh, I'm feeling quite overwhelmed with my workload. Some of the professors assign so much reading that it feels like they don't consider our other assignments. I understand that college can be demanding, but one important skill you'll learn here is time management. It's crucial to prioritize your tasks and know when to say no to social engagements if you have a paper or assignment due. Yeah, you're right. I'll keep that in mind. By the way, how are you finding the material we're covering in class? Actually, I wanted to talk to you about that. Early childhood development has caught my interest because I have a six-month-old niece. Piaget's theory on development is quite fascinating. Yes, Piaget's theory is well known. He proposed that cognitive development in children occurs in observable stages. Exactly. My niece seems to be in the sensory motor stage, where she believes objects disappear when they are out of sight. That's correct. It takes time for babies to understand object permanence. I've been permanence. observing her closely, and I thought it would be interesting to write my term paper about her behavior. Is that okay? Well, actually... The assignment is to research existing literature on a specific psychological topic and write about it. Piaget's research was extensive, involving more than just observing his children. I provided a list of suggested topics for you to choose from. I see. What if I research whether cognitive development can be accelerated? For example, if I retrieve a hidden object while my niece watches, would she learn earlier that objects don't disappear? I appreciate your enthusiasm but conducting such an experiment might not yield meaningful results. Remember, this is an introductory psychology course, and the focus is on understanding existing research. I understand. I've already invested a lot of time watching my niece, though. I appreciate your effort, but it's important to recognize the limitations of conducting original research without proper training. I suggest reviewing the list of topics I provided. There's at least one related to cognitive development. If you have any further questions, feel free to come and see me again. All right, I'll take a look at the topics and consider your advice. Thank you for guiding me through this. You're welcome. Remember, I'm here to help. Good luck with your research and don't hesitate to reach out if you need any assistance. What is the conversation mainly about?
Why does the student talk about a specific phase in child development? Why does the professor mention Piaget's research approach? Why does the professor refuse the student's suggestion about writing on his knees? Listen again to part of the lecture. Then answer the question. I appreciate your enthusiasm, but conducting such an experiment might not yield meaningful results. Remember, this is an introductory psychology course, and the focus is on understanding existing research. Why does the professor say this? I appreciate your enthusiasm, but conducting such an experiment might not yield meaningful results. Listen to part of a lecture in a biology class. Today, we're going to delve into the fascinating topic of bird migration and specifically focus on homing, which involves birds finding their way back to an exact location, regardless of their starting point or the distance traveled. Now, can anyone tell me why this ability to home is so remarkable? Homing is remarkable because it allows birds to return to a specific location even if they have never been there before. It's almost like they have an internal GPS. Homing is an extraordinary skill that has evolved in many bird species. It provides them with significant advantages in terms of survival and reproductive success. Now, let's explore why homing is beneficial for birds. Homing skills contribute to the survival of offspring. Birds that can return to a specific location, such as a suitable nesting site or a reliable food source, increase the chances of their offspring thriving. This parental efficiency is crucial for the survival of bird populations. Now, let's consider the scenario of birds migrating south for the winter. How do they find their way back home when they return in the spring? Any ideas? Some birds might accidentally get displaced during their migration due to strong winds or storms. So, they would need to find their way back to their nesting grounds once they arrive. Accidental displacement can indeed occur during migration, and birds need to navigate their way back home. But here's an interesting question. Do the mechanisms used for migration also apply to homing? Any thoughts? Yes, Emily? I believe celestial bodies, magnetic fields, and landmarks could serve as navigational aids for homing. Birds might utilize these cues to find their way back to their nesting grounds. Precisely, Emily. Birds may rely on celestial bodies, such as the sun or stars, as well as the Earth's magnetic field and familiar landmarks to navigate during homing. However, 
the exact mechanisms and cues used by birds are still being studied. Let's take the example of gannets, large seabirds known for their remarkable diving abilities. Gannets are believed to memorize their environment and use visual cues like coastlines to navigate during homing. Their ability to pinpoint their nests amidst vast colonies is truly remarkable. Now, it's important to note that bird navigation is a complex process. Birds often use multiple cues simultaneously and integrate information from various sources. The interplay between celestial cues, magnetic fields, landmarks, and even olfactory cues adds to the complexity of bird navigation. As scientists, we have the opportunity to explore bird navigation further through research experiments. We can investigate the specific cues birds rely on during homing and understand how they integrate and prioritize these cues. It's crucial, however, to avoid anthropomorphizing bird behavior and to approach our research with objectivity and scientific rigor. Understanding the intricacies of bird navigation and homing not only expands our knowledge of avian biology, but also provides insights into the broader field of animal behavior. The remarkable abilities of birds continue to inspire awe and curiosity, and there is still much to uncover in this captivating area of research. What is the lecture mainly about? According to the professor, how does homing behavior differ from migration behavior in birds? According to the professor, birds take different paths when leaving the nest to hunt for food than when they return. Why? Why does the professor discuss gannets? What does the professor suggest about the student research experiments on bird navigation? Listen again to part of the lecture. Then answer the question. Precisely. Emily. Birds may rely on celestial bodies, such as the sun or stars, as well as the Earth's magnetic field and familiar landmarks to navigate during homing. Why does the student say this? Precisely. Emily.
Listen to part of a lecture in an archaeology class. Today we're going to address a common misconception about archaeology. Contrary to popular belief, archaeology involves much more than just digging. It is a multidisciplinary field that relies on various techniques and technologies to uncover the mysteries of our past. Now let's explore one such technology that has revolutionized archaeological investigations. Can anyone tell me what it is? Sarah? Is it ground penetrating radar, Professor? Professor, good guess, Sarah. While ground penetrating radar is indeed used in archaeology, I was referring to another exciting technology called the muon detector. It is an advanced tool that utilizes muons, which are subatomic particles resulting from cosmic rays, to create images of structures without the need for excavation. Let's explore how it works. Muon detectors are designed to detect and measure muons that penetrate solid matter. When muons pass through denser material, such as rock or soil, they lose energy, allowing the detector to differentiate between empty spaces and denser areas. This process is similar to how X-rays work, but instead of using radiation, muon detectors rely on naturally occurring muons. With the advancements in muon detection technology, Archaeologists can now obtain images that resemble X-rays. These images provide valuable insights into the internal structures of archaeological sites, such as pyramids, tombs, or ancient buildings, without the need for extensive excavation. Now, let's discuss the practicality of using muon detectors in archaeological studies. While the concept is fascinating, there were initial challenges in terms of cost, size, and the time required to produce usable images. However, recent advancements have made the technology more practical and accessible for archaeologists. By utilizing smaller and more portable muon detectors, researchers can now conduct surveys in different archaeological sites efficiently. These detectors capture data over some time, and sophisticated algorithms translate that data into detailed images of the structures. This non-invasive approach has the potential to save significant time and resources in archaeological investigations. However, it's important to recognize that muon detection technology does have its limitations. The time required to produce high-resolution images can be lengthy, and the interpretation of the data still requires expertise. Additionally, muon detectors are more effective in detecting larger structures rather than smaller artifacts or delicate features. Despite these limitations, the potential benefits of muon detection in archaeology make it a promising tool for future studies. It allows us to explore hidden structures, decipher the layout of ancient cities, and gain insights into the construction techniques of the past. In conclusion, archaeology is a multidimensional field that incorporates advanced technologies like the muon detector. These tools enhance our ability to understand and interpret the past, providing valuable information without the need for extensive excavation. While there are still challenges and limitations, the continuous advancements in muon detection technology open new doors for archaeological research. What is the lecture mainly about? What makes muons particularly helpful for archaeologists? According to the professor, what details can a muon detector reveal about an old building?
Why does the professor talk about harm to ancient sites? According to the professor, how have muon detectors changed since 1967? What does the professor think about the newer muon detectors? Listen to a conversation between a student and a professor at an archaeology lecture. Professor, you mentioned that archaeologists use various techniques to locate and date artifacts. Could you elaborate on some of these techniques? Of course. One of the challenges in archaeological investigations, particularly in places like Iceland, is locating buried artifacts. In Iceland, it's not so much the ice that poses a challenge, but rather erosion due to the lack of trees to hold down the soil. Much of Iceland is covered by deep deposits of soil as a result. So, does that mean everything is buried under the soil in Iceland because of the cold? Not necessarily. While the cold climate does contribute to the preservation of some artifacts, it's erosion that has buried much of Iceland. However, there is an interesting aspect to the construction of early Icelandic houses that can make them difficult to locate underground. What aspect is that, Professor? Early Icelandic houses were often constructed using compressed peat because of the scarcity of wood. The walls made of peat blend with the surrounding soil, making them challenging to identify underground. That sounds like a significant hurdle for archaeologists. How do they locate these buried peat walls then? Well, archaeologists have employed various techniques to overcome this challenge. One modern technique used by geophysicists is electromagnetic remote sensing. This tool allows them to detect buried structures by distinguishing between different materials beneath the ground. That's fascinating. It must be incredibly helpful in locating archaeological sites. But what is the archaeological significance of Iceland? Iceland holds great historical interest, particularly due to its rich collection of sagas. These sagas are medieval texts that describe the settlement and exploration of Iceland. Archaeologists often use these sagas as references and seek to validate their accounts through archaeological findings. Are there any notable Viking-era sites in Iceland that have been discovered through archaeology? Absolutely. Archaeological sites associated with this saga have been found in Iceland. The saga describes Norse explorers settling in North America, and ongoing efforts aim to find additional evidence supporting this account. That's incredible! So. How does electromagnetic remote sensing aid in locating these archaeological sites in Iceland? The remote sensing tool allows geophysicists to map the subsurface and differentiate between different materials. By analyzing the data collected, they can identify anomalies that may indicate buried structures. Using this technique, researchers discovered the remains of a large farmhouse believed to belong to the Thorfinnsson family. That's a remarkable discovery. I can see how important the remote sensing tool is in uncovering hidden archaeological sites, like the Viking-era structure you mentioned. Why does the student go to see the professor?
What's the main topic the professor talks about regarding archaeology in Iceland? According to the conversation, why are old Icelandic houses hard to find? Why does the professor mention Viking exploration tales in Icelandic sagas? What type of information does the remote sensing tool offer? Listen to part of a lecture in a biology class. Today, we'll be discussing how animals adapt their behaviors to suit their environments. To illustrate this, let's take a look at a case study involving two species of marmots, the eastern marmot and the Olympic marmot. These furry creatures provide us with valuable insights into animal behavior, despite their hibernation habits. Now, can anyone tell me why it is advantageous to observe marmots outside of their hibernation period? The eastern marmots are found in the eastern region of North America, where the climate is temperate. During the growing season, which lasts for at least five months, the marmots engage in various activities such as mating, playing, and eating. The growing season refers to the availability of food due to the absence of snow and frost covering vegetation. It's an important factor that influences their behavior. The eastern marmots are known to be territorial, solitary, and aggressive. Their mating rituals are impersonal, and once mating is complete, they quickly go their separate ways. Offspring become independent from their mothers within six to eight weeks after birth. The favorable environmental conditions and their solitary nature contribute to their quick independence. Now, Let's shift our focus to the Olympic marmots. These marmots inhabit a habitat with a harsher climate and a shorter growing season. These environmental conditions necessitate cooperation for survival, leading to extended care for offspring until they are physically capable of independence. The Olympic marmots exhibit familial and cooperative behavior, living in communal groups and providing extended care for their young. It's fascinating to see how animals adapt their behavior based on environmental factors. For example, African wild dogs exhibit highly social behavior and live in cooperative packs. They have a complex social hierarchy, and each pack member has a role to play in hunting, raising young, and defending the territory. They rely on their cooperative hunting strategies to take down larger prey. Similarly, meerkats. Small mammals found in the Kalahari Desert exhibit cooperative behavior within their social groups called mobs. They take turns standing guard, 
alerting others to potential dangers while the rest of the group forages for food. These examples highlight how animals adapt their behaviors to enhance their survival and reproductive success in their respective environments. Environmental factors such as climate, resource availability, and predation pressure all play significant roles in shaping animal behavior. What is the lecture mainly about? Why professor consider marmot for the case study? Why does the professor mention marmot behaviors differ? Why does the professor say this? During the growing season, which lasts for at least five months, Why do African wild dogs exhibit highly social behavior and live in cooperative packs? How do meerkats exhibit cooperative behavior? Speaking section. The speaking section tests your ability to communicate in English in an academic setting. During the test, you will be presented with four speaking questions. The questions ask for a response to a single question, a talk, or a lecture. The prompts and questions are presented on time. You may take notes as you listen, but notes are not graded. You may use your notes to answer the questions. Some of the questions ask for a response to a reading passage and a talk or a lecture. The reading passages and the questions are written, but the directions will be spoken. Your reading will be evaluated on both the fluency of the language and the accuracy of the content. You will have 15 to 20 seconds to prepare and 45 to 60 seconds to respond to each question. 
Typically, a good response will require all of the response time and the answer will be complete by the end of the response time. You have about 17 minutes to complete the speaking section. A clock on the screen will show you how much time you have to prepare each of your answers and how much time you have to record each response. You will now be asked a question about a familiar topic. After you hear the question, you will have 15 seconds to plan your response and 45 seconds to speak. Do you agree or disagree that teachers need to maintain a strict professional distance from their students? You will now read a short passage and then listen to a conversation on the same topic. You will then be asked a question about the passages. After you hear the question, you will have 30 seconds to prepare your response and 60 seconds to speak. You have 45 seconds to read the passage below. Listen to two students discussing this article. Ah, construction during the semester is the worst. It's so hard to concentrate in class with all that drilling and hammering. I totally agree. Plus, it can be dangerous navigating construction zones, especially when you're rushing between classes. This new policy of summer construction sounds like a good idea. Yeah, having a quiet campus during the school year would be amazing. But wouldn't summer construction projects take longer and cost more? That's a valid concern. But some universities already do summer construction, and they seem to manage just fine. My cousin goes to a school with a similar policy, and they get a lot done during the break without any disruption to classes. Interesting. Maybe they could even use the summer to tackle some bigger projects that would take too long during the semester. That way, the campus wouldn't be constantly under construction throughout the year. Exactly. And with no students around, there wouldn't be any safety worries or noise complaints. Summer construction seems like a win-win for everyone. The woman expresses her opinion about the proposal described in the letter. Briefly summarize the proposal. Then state her opinion about the proposal and explain the reasons she gives for holding that opinion.
You will now read a short passage and then listen to a lecture on the same topic. You will then be asked a question about the passage. After you hear the question you have 30 seconds to prepare your response and 60 seconds to speak. You have 45 seconds to read the passage below. You may begin reading now. Now listen to part of a lecture in a population dynamics class. Today, we are going to discuss the influence of biotic and abiotic factors on population dynamics. Let's consider the example of a predator-prey relationship to understand this concept better. In an ecosystem, predators feed on prey, and this interaction has a direct impact on population sizes. First, let's focus on the predator population. If there is an abundance of prey, the predator population will thrive due to an ample food supply. This leads to population growth among the predators. However, as the predator population increases, the number of prey decreases due to predation. This creates a scarcity of food for predators, resulting in a decline in their population. Second, let's consider the prey population. With fewer predators, the prey population can grow rapidly. This occurs because predation pressure is reduced, allowing the prey population to reproduce and increase in numbers. However, as the prey population becomes more abundant, it provides a greater food supply for predators. This leads to an increase in predator population size, resulting in higher predation rates on the prey. Thus, the example of the predator-prey relationship demonstrates how biotic factors, such as predation, can influence population dynamics. Explain how the example from the professor's lecture illustrates the concept of biotic factors in population dynamics. You will now listen to part of a lecture, you will then be asked a question about it after you hear the question you will have 20 seconds to prepare your response and 60 seconds to speak. Listen to part of a lecture in an environmental science class. Today, we will explore how producing electricity benefits certain fish. There are two strategies that can be used to ensure the well-being of fish populations in relation to electricity generation. Firstly. One strategy involves the implementation of fish-friendly turbines in hydroelectric power plants. These turbines are designed to minimize harm to fish by reducing the risk of injury or mortality during their passage through the turbine system. For example, the turbine blades can be modified to have a smoother surface or larger gaps to allow fish to pass through more safely. 
This approach helps maintain fish populations in rivers or streams where hydroelectric plants are installed. Secondly, another strategy focuses on creating fish migration pathways around dams. Dams can hinder fish migration and disrupt their natural life cycles. By constructing fish ladders or fishways, fish are provided with alternative routes to bypass the dam and continue their migration. These fishways can consist of a series of steps or pools that allow fish to swim upstream or downstream, depending on their migration patterns. This strategy helps to protect and support fish populations affected by dam construction. Using the examples from the lecture, explain two ways that producing electricity benefits certain fish. For this task, you will read a passage and listen to a lecture about an academic topic. You may take notes during this time. After the passages have finished, you will then be asked a question about them. After the question, you will have 20 minutes to write your response. Effective responses are usually between 250 to 350 words. You may look at the reading passage and your notes as you write. Keep in mind that the question will not ask for your opinion. You have three minutes to read. You may begin reading now.
Now listen to part of a lecture on the topic you just read about. There is no solid evidence that the 52 Hz whale song is solely a result of its physiological traits. The arguments cited in the reading selection are not convincing and fail to consider alternative explanations for the unique vocalizations of this solitary creature. First, the consistency of the whale's vocalizations over time may not necessarily indicate a biological origin. It is possible that external factors, such as environmental conditions or variations in oceanic soundscapes, contribute to the consistent frequency observed. Therefore, the argument that the whale's song is purely a product of its physiological makeup lacks sufficient evidence. Second, while the inability to find a mate is an unfortunate consequence of the 52 Hz whale's unique vocalizations, it does not definitively prove a direct link between its physiology and its song. Other factors, such as behavioral adaptations or social dynamics, could play a role in hindering successful mating attempts. Thus, the assumption that the whale's physiological condition is solely responsible for its isolation may overlook these alternative explanations. Third, the presence of physical anomalies in the whale's vocal apparatus does not necessarily imply a direct correlation with its distinct song. Structural differences alone do not provide conclusive evidence that the 52 Hz whale's unique frequency is solely a result of its physiological characteristics. Other factors, such as learning and cultural influences, might contribute to the development and maintenance of its vocalizations.